the parable we're going to discuss today is uh, one of the parables of Jesus, of course, but it's very likely a parable that you have uh, that you have never heard about before. So before you tune out and think, oh, the parables, I know the parables. I thought we were going to talk about something else. Uh, this is a parable that uh, chances are you have not heard about. I certainly haven't. And uh, it's actually one of the very important and very significant parables that Jesus gave. We know in the scriptures that one of the most common ways Jesus taught was in parables. There are plenty of parables recorded for us in the Bible. And uh, uh, with uh, Luke having the biggest count, there's something else here. With Luke having the biggest count of parables, approximately 28 parables in Luke, Matthew 23, in Mark, only nine. Of course, there is an overlap there because some of them repeat the parables. Interestingly enough, if you look at all the different commentaries, all the different uh, gospel harmonies and, and the records of the parables, you'll find all these parables recorded from Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But usually the commentators say there are no parables from the gospel of? of John. All the parables Jesus gave are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, but in John we don't have any parables. And uh, the John's Gospel is rather different to, to the other three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, he records things that they don't and vice versa. But uh, today we will actually find that that claim is actually not true. There are parables in the Gospel of John. Parables, not just one. And today we're going to look at one of them, particularly a parable that Jesus spoke. We'll put the title up here. And uh, this is the parable of the comforter. That's what we're going to talk about today. The parable of the comforter. In the Gospel of John, we have recorded for us a very important discourse that Jesus gave to his disciples straight after the Last Supper that is not recorded in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. If you read the account in those three Gospels, you, you think that they just finished supper, they got out, and Jesus got, got arrested. That's, that's the implication. That's, that's the impression you get, because there's nothing in between. Whereas in the Gospel of John, you actually have find about four chapters of Christ speaking with His disciples, giving them a very important discourse. In that discourse, there are some very beautiful and very profound truths particularly is in that location is where Jesus actually spoke about the Comforter. And uh, why did I say it is the parable of the Comforter? Because in the Gospel of John, we actually have parables recorded according to Jesus Christ himself. Uh, John chapter 16, this is what it says in verse 25. John chapter 16 and verse 25, Jesus speaking, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. What's another word for Proverbs? Parables. It's parables. What does parable mean? Parable means an illustration, a symbol, a figure, an allegory. Is that right? Yeah. So here we, we see at the end of this discourse, chapter 16, towards the end of where he finished speaking, he actually says that the things he just finished speaking were actually communicated in what form? As parables or proverbs. What was he speaking? What was the subject that he was speaking about in these proverbs or these parables? It says it right there in the verse. Because this is something very important to keep in mind. The subject he was talking to, the, to them about was showing them of the Father, but He was showing them in what way? In parables, and in contrast to that, He says, a time is coming when I will show you plainly of the Father. Same subject, different ways of communicating. Can you see that? This is a vital, vital component to understanding this discourse of Christ. This discourse of Christ is by far the most misunderstood discourse that Jesus gave. These parables, happen to have in them, the one we're going to focus on today is, of course, the parable of the Comforter, is by far the most misunderstood passage that Jesus spoke about. And misunderstanding that has given, uh, has given rise to 
one of the most bizarre and outrageous ideas that God's Spirit is someone other than God or Christ. A most prevalent idea, a different person to the Father and the Son that goes by the very popular and very unbiblical title of God the Holy Spirit. The number one passage in the scriptures that people go to to prove that the Holy Spirit is a different person to the Father or the Son is this passage from this discourse that Jesus gave. Interestingly enough, Jesus refers to that passage and the way he was communicating in that passage that he was communicating in parables or proverbs. See the thing about parables is this, you cannot take a parable as plain speech according to the verse we just read. It's the opposite of plain speech, it's a figure, it's something, a, me a means of communication that you need to interpret, that you need to understand, you can't take it at face value, otherwise you will arrive at a very serious misunderstanding, as we shall see. So this is why we're talking about the parable of the Comforter. Now, this passage, when Jesus says in John 16, he's speaking in parables, well, what's he referring to? Because the entire discourse is only one, it's one package. Even though there are different chapters, the divisions of chapters, it wasn't there. Jesus speaks and he's speaking with his disciples and after he finishes speaking, he says, listen, I told you all these things in parables. A time is coming and I'll tell you, show you plainly of the Father. Well, when, did, when does this start, this mo mode of communication? It actually starts in chapter 14. And we'll see specifically where that is. Interestingly enough as well, uh, by the way, the, the parable of the Comforter is not the only one that Jesus spoke about. He spoke about the parable of the Comforter, he spoke about the vine and the branches, he spoke about the, the woman travailing in birth. These are some of the parables that he gave in that discourse. The one I want to focus on today is the parable of the Comforter. Interestingly enough, this expression, Comforter, only appears in the Gospel of John. Nowhere else does it appear in the other Gospels. It's not in Matthew, it's not in Mark, and it's not in Luke. And in the Gospel of John, it only appears four times. And all four times, it only appears in this discourse that Jesus finishes and concludes by saying, I told you these things in parables. And it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Gospels. That's why we're talking about the parable of the Comforter. So I want to look at these four occurrences of the word comforter and see what we can learn from this parable. The first one is John 14 and verse 16. John 14, 16, the number one go-to verse to prove that the Holy Spirit is a different person, another person. And I will pray the Father, Jesus said, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Well, there you go, brother. There you go, sister. It says another comforter. What more do you want? Someone other than Christ. That's what it sounds like, correct? Well, what does Jesus mean? Before we get into the meaning, I want to uh, illustrate the danger of basing doctrine on parables that Jesus gave, but not, not treating them as parables. I'll give you an example that we're all familiar with. The state of the dead, what we believe about the state of the dead, is kind of unique to us as Adventists. Uh, most people don't believe that about the state of the dead. They believe that when you die, you go to heaven or hell and so on and so forth. What is the strongest passage that people use to prove that when you die, you go somewhere? It's a story that Jesus gave, right? The rich man and Lazarus. You know that that's a parable? And reading the parable literally and taking it as plain speech, taking it as it reads exactly, without interpreting it, without understanding what Jesus was intending, results in amazing and dangerous conclusions. In like manner is this parable. And it doesn't matter how many verses you might show to the person you know when you sleep, uh, sorry, when you die, you're asleep, your thoughts perish, there is no thanksgiving in the grave, there's all these verses, doesn't matter. The story of Lazarus and the rich man answers all. Doesn't matter how much evidence you might have. In like manner, it doesn't matter how much Bible you might show someone that the Spirit of God cannot be anyone other than God. People get stuck on this verse, particularly this, uh, this phrase. Another comforter. That's it. That answers everything. It shuts out everything. So Jesus did not intend for us to read his words here as plain speech, as we shall see. So why does Jesus speak? 
about this very important subject in parables. Why didn't he just speak plainly? Well, the reason is he was speaking plainly, but then a problem occurred with his listeners. And that problem caused him to change his manner of speaking and begin to communicate in, in parables, in illustrations, and in figures, not in plain speech. And we see that just a few verses earlier. Notice, the lead up to this is very significant to help us understand what follows. In John, we're still in chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Important verse. What's Jesus trying to communicate to them? He was trying to tell them about the Father, his relationship to the Father. Correct? And he's telling them that they know the Father because they have seen the Father. And then, someone in the class pipes up with a question. That really shocks Jesus. Philip, right? Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And you can see that the surprise in the answer that Jesus gives. Verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? There's a tone of surprise here. And Philip probably was not uh, just speaking about himself. His question probably expressed some of the, you know, puzzlement or, or the request that other disciples must have thought. Here is Jesus, spent three and a half years with them. And he's telling them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I am the way to the Father. And then Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father and, and that'll be enough. We'll be happy. And, 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 and Jesus realizes there's something here that, that they missed something, something very important. And he's surprised. He says, Philip, aren't you listening to what I'm telling you? Don't you get it? After three and a half years, you don't get it? How are you asking this question? And then, notice why he expected the disciples to get it. Verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Don't you realize that? That's what he's telling them, right? And from this point on, Jesus begins to address and explain this particular point in the parables that follow. He's explaining his relationship with his father, this connection he has with the father, and he does so by using a number of parables, and one of them is the parable of the, the comforter. This is the launching point for what follows. And if you miss the points in these verses, guaranteed you will misunderstand the parable. So these two points I don't want to miss, I want to put it here. The key point, number one, this discourse is about knowing the Father. That's what he says. From henceforth you've seen him, you know him. And Philip says, show us the Father. So it's about knowing, about revealing who the Father is. And the key point number two uh, that we read, in verse 10, the Father is in Christ, in Christ and Christ is in the, in the Father, right? That's what he told his, uh, Philip. These two points, brothers and sisters, you have to keep in mind when you read the rest of the discourse. These are the points Jesus is trying to communicate. If you miss those, you will miss the whole point of the passage and you will arrive at strange conclusions. Most people have arrived at strange conclusions from this passage. So, with that in mind, I want to go back to this verse we just read, where Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Verse 16. That he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Who is Jesus talking about? Okay, the most common answer we give is himself. Alright, I, I know that. I've said that as well. But in context of what he was communicating. Just compare with verse 7 that we just read earlier. In verse 7 he says, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Then in verse 17 he tells, us, he tells them, This spirit of truth is someone that they know. He says, You know him. Who is he talking about? 
Okay, we have mixed answers. We have confusion in the audience. Okay, remember the three points. This passage is about revealing the Father and Christ is where? In the Father and the Father is where? In the Son. So it's not one or the other. When you have Christ, you have the Father. The passage is about communicating or revealing the Father. And the only way to reveal the Father is through the way, the truth, and the life, through the Son. So Christ here is, is telling them about the Father that they know because He, Christ, was with them. Isn't that right? And so the, it's not just Christ. It's the Father is in Christ. You can't, you can't uh, leave that out. You can't separate them. That's right. Thank you. Key point to keep in mind. And so he goes on to say in verse 18, as we're all familiar, and this is why I know most of you gave the answer you gave, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. This is who he was referring to when he was referring to the comforter. But he doesn't come alone. I think I clarified that. It is the Father in the Son. Because the whole point, brothers and sisters, of the plan of salvation is to reconnect man with God. That connection is Christ. That's the point. That's the purpose and that's the work and that is who the comforter is. What Jesus was doing was he was elaborating on that little truth that Philip had asked about. Now, interestingly enough, the disciples understood the identity of the comforter and who was coming. The listeners there at that evening they understood, they heard and understood. We know that because a little later in John 14, verse 22, just a little later, a few verses later, it says, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Who is Judas asking about here when he says thou? Christ. So who did Judas understand was going to come? Christ. His question was not who, his question is a question of? How? They did not understand how is this going to happen? How is this different? How is this different to you being with us now? How will you reveal yourself in a way to us but not to the world? Obviously there was going to be a difference. But they definitely understood who. They understood that it was you know, none other than Christ who would return with the Father in Him to give a more intimate and more personal revelation of the Father to each and every one. And so Jesus answers him in verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's the Father and the Son. Or, as Jesus says, the Father in the Son. Right? That's the Comforter. And someone will say, Well, brother, you know, that sounds good. That sounds even convincing. But Jesus said, another comforter. Isn't that right? To that I say, he did. It's a parable. It's a parable. Why do you take it at face value? Why do you take it as plain speech? Because people say another and they go and define the words and, 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 and go into all kinds of places. It's a parable. I know it sounds like someone else because there are other parables, as we shall see, where Jesus did speak about himself and it sounds like someone else. And nobody has any problem in those other places. <laughs> the problem only exists in this passage. Why is that? Because of tradition. So Christ does not abandon his disciples. He comes to them to bring to them the presence of the Father. That's the intent of the parable of the Comforter. The second occurrence of the word Comforter is in John 14. Not far, uh, you know, it says all in the same passage. Uh, verse 25. This is occurrence number two. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Someone say, well, there you go, brother. You might, have, you might have had a good case on the first one, but look, it says here, the Comforter is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and He will teach all things. He's a teacher. And it says He, right? That has to be 
someone else, a different person to Christ. When Jesus says he, he's obviously talking about someone else. It does sound like someone else, doesn't it? You know why? Because it's a parable. L look, this is not a parable according to my opinion. This is not my take on the, on the matter, okay? Jesus said he spoke this way. Not me. The problem is, when we read these passages, because Jesus did not preface his discourse with, hear ye the parable of the comforter, <laughs> like he did with all the other parables, right? The parable of the sower and the parable of the, you know, the kingdom of God is like this and like... He didn't preface that, so we don't read it that way. He, he said it after he finished speaking, and it's about three chapters further. And so we don't make this connection because we look at a little piece of few verses right here, and we don't see them in their context. It's one package. It's one passage. And so we can't neglect that. So Jesus is telling them, I'm speaking now while I'm with you. But the Comforter will speak further. What it is, it's basically Jesus still continuing to speak, but in a different way, in a different form, in them and not just with them. Now, the Father, it says here in this verse, sends the Comforter and he sends him in whose name? In Jesus' name. And it tells us very plainly here, this Comforter is the Holy Spirit. What about this teaching? Why does Jesus say, He shall teach all things? Why didn't He say, I will teach you all things? Well, that's implied in verse 21, uh, sorry, 25, where He says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. And the implication is, there are other things I will speak while not being present with you in the same way, but that will happen through this comforter. And He was speaking this way because... He was speaking a parable. I want to show you another example of that in another very familiar parable from the book of John. We're going to spend a lot of time in John. In John 10, verse 2 and 3, he says, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. Who is this good shepherd? Who is the good shepherd? Are you sure about that? Okay, I hope I am. <laughs> Listen, it says here this, this individual, now Jesus is speaking, he says him. This individual, he has a voice, he says they hear his voice, he calls. He doesn't say, I call. He says he calls. And he also leads these sheep. It sounds like someone else, right? You know why? Because in verse 6 it tells us this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. He was speaking in, in parables. And you know the word for parable here is the identical word for parable that is mentioned in John 16 that we read at the beginning. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. In the Greek, it's the same word. Look it up. Now, we know that Jesus is... Uh, the good shepherd, we're going to see in a minute. But notice carefully. Jesus says that the comforter will teach all things. And here he says the good shepherd will speak and he will lead out his sheep. It's the same mode of communication. It says he will lead, he will speak, the comforter, he will teach you. And in both cases, he says I was speaking in parables. How is it that we take one and interpret it one way, and another passage, we interpret it as another person. another person. In a totally different way. You know, Jesus explained himself in John 10, 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And a little later, after telling them about the comforter who will come, who will teach them, he says in John 14, 28, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Interspersed in his discourse are explanations for what he's talking about. He did it with the Good Shepherd, he does it with the Comforter. Now this is a serious matter. I want to put it to you this way, brothers and sisters. It is an absolutely outrageous thing to teach that the Comforter is someone other than Christ. 
It is utterly ludicrous. The problem is, we hear it so often. We are so used to it. It doesn't hit us, it doesn't impact us how outrageous it is as it should. I want to illustrate to you how outrageous it is. If I were to stand up here today and suggest to you that the Good Shepherd was someone other than Christ, what would you think? What if I said, look, I have a Bible study here, you know, just listen to my verses. I, might, I even have a Sabbath school lesson. What, what would you think, honestly? Okay, you think I'm crazy. Would you think perhaps that it's a bit of an insult to Christ to rub from Him this description and this, uh, uh, you know, work of being the Good Shepherd and attribute that to someone else? And I tell you, listen, it's someone other than Christ. Because he says he and all these reasons that I have very good reasons. It's totally outrageous, right? In the same manner, in no less manner is it, to suggest that the Comforter is someone other than Christ. It is utterly outrageous. Consistency demands that if you teach and believe that the Comforter is a different person to Christ, then the Good Shepherd has to be someone other than Christ. And hopefully that illustrates just how terrible of a thing it is. But yet, it is so very common. Why? Because we don't perhaps realize that right there Jesus was speaking in parables. That just makes everything so simple. So very, very simple. In the interlude, before we go on to the other passages, the, the other two references for comfort here, we have the par in John 15, we have the parable of the vine and the branches. In the vine and the branches, there are three outstanding features in that parable. There is the vine, there are the branches, and then there is the husbandman, right? I'm reviewing, I'm not going to go in detail. Three, and remember, that parable also illustrates the same truth. It's revealing who? The Father, based on the fact that the Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. The vine and the branches is another way Christ is demonstrating the work and the identity of the Comforter. How the Father and the disciples are going to be connected. The connection between the husbandman and the branches is through whom? The vine. The, the Father or the husbandman provides the vine with life, sustenance and nourishment. Through the vine, the branches receive this life, sustenance and nourishment. That's another illustration of the Comforter. That's the connection. Different way to illustrate the same truth. Anyway, that's not my subject, just an interlude showing that Jesus is just talking about the same thing. The third occurrence is in John 15. Occurrence number three, John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Amen. So this Comforter now, it says, refers to it as well as the Spirit of truth. Then it tells us it comes from somewhere. What is the source of the Comforter? It proceeds from the Father. Just excuse me a minute. And again, this is one of these passages that people, sorry, that people say, we'll see right there at the end of the passage, brother. It says what? He shall testify of me. Oh, that's a good one because he and Jesus says me in the same passage. And that proves that it cannot be him. Right? You know, how can he be saying, I will testify of me? That doesn't make sense. So he has to be a different person. Isn't that right? Well, it sounds like it. Definitely. Why does it sound like it? Because it's a parable. Good. Look, this, this is important. I'm going to keep asking that all through. We cannot neglect that. Let's look at this a little closer. It proceeds from the Father. Jesus sends it from the Father. This time Christ, it says, is the one who sends it. And it's called the Spirit of Truth. Earlier in the same discourse, Jesus told his disciples what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we said that this Spirit proceeds from the Father. Who did Jesus say was dwelling in the Father? Who? Himself, right? Christ. Was anyone else? Did he say it was anyone else? So you see now, he's speaking now in a parable. He says, listen, the spirit of truth proceeds from the Father and comes to you, this comforter. And what happens is, he testifies of me. 
What does that mean? You know, the Father, in sending the Comforter, testifies of His Son and the truthfulness of the words of His Son. Because the Father is included there too. How does the Father do that? He does that by sending the Comforter in Christ's name. Later on in the Bible, we're going to see exactly what that is talking about. So, the Spirit of Christ in the heart will testify of the truthfulness of the words of Christ. He will testify of me. Yes, Jesus did speak and make it sound like it was someone else. Because the disciples were not getting his plain speech. So he resorted to parables. This is how he communicated, not only in this passage, but in other passages. There is a confirmation that will happen. Notice how Jesus puts it in John 14 and verse 20. He says, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. What day? The day when the Comforter comes. He says you're going to learn something. You're not going to learn that there's someone else in the picture. What are they going to learn? They're going to realize something. He says you're going to know. Know here is to know by experience. You're going to know the truthfulness of my words. You're going to realize this relationship I have with my Father that I want to give to you when this Comforter comes at that day. And when that happens, that will testify and affirm all these things that I am telling you. Amazing how one of the most profound passages in the Bible that tell us about the relationship between the Father and the Son has been twisted and abused to teach this most outrageous and Christ-insulting idea and to rob Christ from the honor and the credit that is due to Him and give it to some other nameless person. Amen. It is honestly a little bit of a testimony to the ingenuity of the devil. That this passage, look, Jesus is with His disciples. He's about to die. He's about to be arrested and die. That's it. Last time He's speaking to them in this way. Of all the topics that there are, the first thing on His mind He wants to communicate with them is this precious truth about Him and the Father and that now the Father is going to be with them. They're going to see Him and then they don't get it. So He goes into this parable to explain it in, in, in childlike form. And we take these, you know, uh, the parable and we take it plainly at face value as it reads and insist it has to be someone else and totally destroy the meaning of the passage completely. And dishonor Christ in the process. That's the third occurrence. Last one, fourth occurrence, John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Something had to happen to Christ before the Comforter could come. What had to happen to Christ? Another passage in John tells us that Christ had to be glorified. So in other words, here's Jesus saying he had to go away and be glorified before this Comforter could come. Something had to happen to Christ himself, to his own person. Which indicates that the Comforter cannot be separated from Him. Unless this thing happened to Him, this Comforter would not come. It's not someone who was waiting on the sidelines for an event to occur, then it would be His turn to go. No, it's something intrinsically linked to Christ Himself. It's linked to His departure, it's linked to His glorification. If those things would not happen, this Comforter would not come or would not be sent, as He says here. If He departs, He will send Him. Even though he's not going to stay with them in the flesh, even though Christ would return in spirit, it's no less of a person. You know, a lot of people go to a lot of trouble to try and prove that the Holy Spirit is a person. And with that, I, to that I say, Amen. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's the person of Christ. It's the person of the Father. Proving it's a person does not prove that it's a different person. You need other verses to do that. You know, grieving the Spirit, yes, I agree with that, it's a person. But that doesn't mean it's a different person. And all the other verses, you know what I'm talking about? And so when people say that, I try and save the time and say, look, I already believe the Spirit is a person. What you need to prove from the Bible is that the Spirit that belongs to someone, an owner, show me one example in the Bible where the Spirit of someone is a different person to the owner of the Spirit. If you can show me that, then you have my attention. But trying to prove that the Spirit is a person, I already believe that. Because Christ was returning. 
and it's no less of a person, even though he is not in the flesh with them physically, where you can see him and feel him physically. He was with them, he would be in them. So this departure of Christ, because, you know, if it was someone different to Christ, if you think about it, why didn't Jesus just say, you know, uh, Spirit, come, or go? Now is your turn. Why did he leave his disciples? And there was a period there of waiting where Christ left. And then, after some time, not immediately, the Comforter came. Why, why the wait? Because it had to do with Christ Himself. It wasn't someone else waiting for a command. Something had to happen to His person. You see, the disciples did not realize or understand this departure of Christ. They had no idea what would happen. Poor disciples, they were in shock. In the garden, when Jesus was arrested and He would not break free, what did they do? They took off in utter disappointment. They had these grand ideas of what Jesus would do and be, and here they're lined up to be in good positions in this new kingdom. And, and this, this business of getting arrested was totally not in their, in their mind. Even though Christ told them repeatedly, and, and there is a reason for this, and that we, the, the reason I'm mentioning, there's a reason, because these disciples were one day little Hebrew boys who went to the Sabbath school in the synagogue every week, right? And, as, and, and they would learn from the elders and the Pharisees and the spiritual leaders about the Messiah and what the Messiah would do based on their understanding, misunderstanding. And then one day these uh, little Hebrew boys would graduate and probably go to the adult uh, Sabbath school over there in the back of the synagogue perhaps, or the equivalent, you know what I'm talking about? And they would continue to learn in their adulthood all these ideas about the Messiah. And what happened? It had filled their mind with all these error, errors. All these false perceptions of what the Messiah would do. And here is Christ telling them with his own mouth, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise the third day. And it goes whew, over their heads. So strong is the prejudice of a presupposed teaching and conclusion in your mind. In like manner today, sadly, we have the exact same thing. People sit in Sabbath school and read a very... Uh, infamous Sabbath school lesson earlier this year. Remember Sabbath school studies on the Holy Spirit? And it tells them the Holy Spirit is this and that and the other and the here these passages are used to prove that it's a different person. And you try and come and share with them the truth and goes over their head. That's what happened with Christ. That's what Christ was facing. Philip illustrated that in the question that he asked Christ, but he wasn't the only one. And so the inbred beliefs and mentality that exists sometimes is a very difficult thing to overcome. Christ had a hard time overcoming that in the minds of his disciples. It took this grave disappointment to shock them, to shock them awake to the reality of, hold on, this, we've been taught a lot of errors. Even then, there were still other things later on. But this is the reason why then Jesus tells them the following. In John 16 and verse 12, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. You understand now why he said those words? He cannot bear them. He's speaking to them plainly. And Philip asks him, you know, a question that totally changes the dynamic of the discussion. So he's telling them, listen, I have so much more to tell you, but you are not in a place to understand that. The implication again here is, there is going to come a time where they can bear them, right? Where they can hear them, where they can understand them. And this Christ will continue to do, not someone else, through this comforter. Verse 13, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. This is how he will tell them the many things further things through the Comforter. So this is the question. Does Jesus send them a new, excuse me, a new teacher to teach them truth? Now what truth is Christ wanting to communicate with them? A revelation of who? The Father. Remember? Does Jesus send them someone else to reveal the Father to them? No, because He's the only one who is in the Father. 
He is going to continue to teach them, but now at a time when they can bear it and through a different means than he was with them in person. He does that in them. Now someone might say, well, you know, it sounds, it sounds good, but look, it says here the Spirit, he will guide them. He will not speak of himself. What he hears, you know, he will speak. He shows things to come. Come on, look, it sounds like someone else here. It does. Yes, I know it sounds like someone else. I agree. It's a parable. parable. That's right. That's good. You're listening. <laughs> it's the Father in the Son. Christ revealing the Father by coming to dwell in them. And then he goes on to say, verse 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And again, people say, well, see, okay, he teaches, he guides. Yeah, that's a parallel to the good shepherd who calls and, and they hear his voice and he leads them. That's the exact same description. There, it's called, he's called, he is called the good shepherd, that's Christ. Here, he is called the comforter. That has to be Christ. But then someone says, but what about verse 14? It says, he shall glorify me. Who is Jesus talking about here? What, Jesus is going to glorify himself? That doesn't make any sense. It has to be someone else. Who glorifies his son? It's the father who glorifies his son. Notice what Jesus says just a little bit earlier in chapter 13. Speaking of Judas, it says, He then, chapter 13 and verse 30, He then having received the soap went immediately out and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. That's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a hard, uh, hard wording there for that passage. But the point I just want to focus on is, according to Christ, who glorifies Him? The Father. the Father glorifies Him. The Most High, the only true God, the source of all. The highest authority in the universe glorifies His Son. He said this in chapter 13, before He begins to speak in these parables. In chapter 17, after he finishes speaking, he's praying to his father, and in that prayer, he says, glorify thou me with thine own self. In John chapter 17, first few verses. You know that passage? It's not here, but if you remember the prayer of Christ. So before and after, he says, the father glorifies me. He asks the father to glorify him. And in the middle, he says, he shall glorify me. How can you conclude that can be anyone else? Absolutely impossible. The Father glorifies the Son. How does He do that? By giving the believer the Spirit of His Son. The Spirit of Truth. It glorifies and magnifies and uplifts what Christ accomplished and makes real what He promised. That brings glory to Christ, not to anyone else. This is what Jesus was saying and this is what Jesus was meaning. So, now we go to John 16. We looked at all four occurrences of the word comforter in the Gospel of John. John 16, 25, this is where we started. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Does that make a bit more sense now? You see what Jesus was talking about? He was showing them plainly of the Father. And these Proverbs, as we saw, begin with his answer to Philip, where he was communicating to them the truth about his connection with the Father and how intimately related they are. Now, when he says, a time is coming, when I shall show you plainly of the Father, what time is he talking about here? When the Comforter comes to lead them and to guide them into all truth, right? He says he will teach, he will do all these things. Here, according to Jesus, who will speak plainly at that time? Christ, the same one who spoke to them in parables of the Father. He's the same one who will speak to them plainly. Do you see it? Now, what is the qualification for Christ to be the one who does all that? He said it already in the passage that we read, his connection with the Father, but there is 
another component that he mentions here. Verse 26, so we, this is verse 25, we'll just read the next few verses, John 16, 26 and 27. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world, again I leave the world, and go to the Father. Okay, plain speech or parable here? What do you think? Plain? Okay, most answers are plain. True. It is plain. So when Jesus was speaking here in verse 27, he says, I came out from God. What's he referring to? He's referring to his sonship to the Father. What qualifies him to be the only one who can truly reveal the Father in this way? To be the one who can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. His qualification for that is that he is the only one that came out from God. He's the only one who is the begotten Son of God. He's the only begotten Son of God. That's what qualifies him to be the teacher and the guide for truth. And he illustrated that in this passage by communicating to them the parable of the Comforter and these other ones as well that we refer to. Now notice how the disciples get this point. Verse 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly. And speakest no proverb. So here Jesus was speaking plainly. So they understood a little bit of something of how that discourse was taking place. That Jesus was speaking in parables. Because when he was, a number of times the disciples asked him questions. You know, Judas, we read one question from Judas. He asked him, Lord, how, how are you going to do this? This doesn't make sense. And then a little later, about, uh, you know, I will go away and come again. They were whispering among themselves. They said, what's he mean when he says, go away and come again? And you can read it, John 16. We didn't read it today. They were asking questions. And this is common because sometimes when they would hear, uh, hear other parables from Jesus, you know, they would come to him privately and tell him, Lord, declare unto us the parable of the sower. What, what do you mean? What does that mean? Explain that to us. And so they were asking questions in the discourse. Now, when he says this, they tell him, this we get. This one here is plain speech. We understand what you're saying here. What did they understand? Verse 30. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. To them this was plain. It wasn't a mystery. It wasn't an enigma. It wasn't a metaphor. What is it what was plain? That he came forth from God. You know what that means? That he's the son of God. That's how they express that faith elsewhere. Peter says it, you know, in Matthew, and Jesus says, Who do men say that I am? And then he asks Peter, or he asks his disciples, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That belief is equivalent to, Thou camest forth from God. They knew and believed who he was. And to them, this answered all, meaning he knew all things, nobody needed to ask him ever anything, and they trusted in him as the Messiah. It was plain to them. It wasn't a role play or a metaphor or a prophecy or a title or any of these ideas. The sonship of Christ was real. And then, in, in light of that, I want, to, uh, I want to ask you this thought question as well. The son's qualification to reveal the Father, according to Him and according to what the disciples understood, is His Sonship. If you believe that the Holy Spirit is a different person to the Son, a different person to the Father, what is His qualification to tell you about the Father? God had how many sons? Only one begotten Son. That's Christ. So if you say, this is not Christ, this is someone else, then pray tell me, what is his qualification? Here you have someone who is not a son of God, who does not, who we are not told dwells in the Father. Someone with no name that we know of, who is going to teach you the truth instead of Christ. And you put Christ on the side and you say, no, no, this is someone else. And you think this is a light thing? You think this is a minor issue? It's okay, brother, why are you making such a fuss? When we get to heaven, we'll find out. You think this is some, some minor detail? This is an absolute insult to Christ. Amen. To deny Him, 
that he is the comforter to deny him that and to give that credit to someone else, you are insulting Christ to that measure. It's a very serious thing, brothers and sisters. The disciples did not have any confusion as to who the comforter was. Today we have confusion in abundance as to who the comforter is. And it's amazing, you know, the passage is not so complicated and so far, uh, you know, reaching and it's a uh, complexity that you have to get into the Greek and parse all the words to figure out what is Jesus saying. It's not that complicated. When you understand how Jesus was communicating, it's actually very, very simple. The disciples never ever came to the conclusion that most people who read that passage come to today. Amazing. They were the ones listening to Jesus. Now, there's a reason why I say that. Galatians 4, 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We all know this verse, but I want you to think about this verse. This is who Jesus, sorry, this is who the Father sends. He sends the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Christ. Amen. You know that this is the comforter? Yes. Question, was Paul here speaking in Proverbs or plainly? Plain, plain. plain speech. This is who Paul understood to be sent into the heart. Jesus says, I'll pray the Father and He will give you another comforter. He said that in a parable. Paul understood that to be the Spirit of Christ sent into the heart and this spirit when it says crying Abba Father that's the spirit elsewhere in the book of Romans called the spirit of adoption right that means you and me can become children of God where God the Father of Christ now becomes our father as well the means and the qualification for you becoming a son of God and a daughter of God of course is that He gives to you the Spirit of His Son. Now don't miss this point, this is significant. If you receive any other Spirit other than the Spirit of His Son, how can you be adopted when He only had one Son? You with me? If you don't receive the Spirit of His only begotten Son, then what Spirit are you receiving? And how do you hope to become a Son of God? When you're not getting the sign, you say, no, 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 it's someone else, brother. Look at the list of verses I have to prove that. Well, what are you trying to prove? That you're not the son of God. You do not have the spirit of adoption. So you know what ends up happening? You end up playing the role of a son of God. Well, that matches up. If you believe that God himself is playing a role of being a father and being a son. It's really a denial of the Christian experience, brothers and sisters. These terms become just that, meaningless terms. This Son of God means nothing more because you don't even believe that the Son of God is a real Son of God. So how can you be a real Son of God? That's another dangerous role play, right? There is only one spirit of adoption. It's the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you don't have that spirit, I'm not sure, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I really care how much theology or arguments you have. If you don't have the spirit of the Son, it's impossible that you have the spirit of adoption. You have to pretend to be a son. Now, after all of this, someone might still say, well, brother, it sounds like a pretty good case, but I still think the comforter is someone else. I'm sorry, I still think the comforter is someone else. And, uh, and here is one final witness I want to share in closing. We'll close with this one. In 1 John chapter 2, we have the final occurrence for the word comforter in the New Testament. There are only five occurrences. There are only four in the Gospels. We looked at that in John. And there's only one other time that it occurs in the Bible. And that's in the letter of John, who was right there in that evening, listening to Jesus, who was inspired to record in his Gospel exclusively, when all the other writers did not record it, to record the parable of the Comforter. And here he is as an old man, as an elder, writing to a church to encourage them in their Christian walk. And this is what he tells them. 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So someone say, well, where's the word Comforter there? Well, it's been translated as? Advocate, okay? Most of us know that, but if you don't know that, 
Advocate there is the exact same Greek word, parakletos, which is translated comforter in the Gospel of John. So here John is telling the, the, the Christians and encouraging them and telling them, listen, remember something. If you run into trouble, you know, if you sin, I want you to remember something. We have with the Father, the comforter. Who is it? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the righteous. Plain speech or proverb? Plain that one's plain. He wrote the proverb. He understood who was meant. And here he is using that truth in a practical way to encourage believers and reminding them. He says, listen, don't you remember? Don't, if you fall into trouble, we have a comforter. Jesus Christ the righteous. That's who John understood the comforter to be. Do you have that comforter? That's the question. I'm not asking whether you understand that. It's pretty plain. Do you have the comfort? Understanding does not mean you have. You know, just, be just because you believe the truth does not necessarily mean the truth is applicable in your life. It should be, but I'm talking about the theory and the practice. Do we have that comforter? God desires, brothers and sisters, that we don't just understand this truth and, and this passage and wow, what a beautiful truth. God desires to transform our life by that. The only way that that is possible is through this comforter, through the spirit of his son. Do you have that? The biggest and best argument for the truth about God is the transformed lives of those who are transformed by the spirit of Christ. You realize that? You know, you can, you can argue till you're blue in the face with people and go into the Greek and the Hebrew and lexicons and, and you have all guns firing and still come away and the person is just as unconvinced as when you started the discussion. And it can be a quite a frustrating thing. But there is no argument that can be put against a changed life and a testimony of what Christ has done in your experience. Christ the righteous, this advocate, this comforter, desires to do that for you and me. And this is what I want to challenge you with. Do you have the comforter? Do you really have him? We have that by faith. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I want to, I want to challenge you with that, that you might make that truth a reality in your experience. And hopefully now, next time, someone takes you to this passage of Scripture to try and show you that the Comforter is someone other than Christ, maybe you have something that you can share with them as far as what the Bible means about that. The parable of the Comforter. Let's kneel as we close with a word of prayer.